We're on a journey, and uh, God has prepared a journey for our lives, and here we are, and, and it's for whosoever wants to go. That's a beauty, beautiful part. It's not based on how much money you have or, or your talent and uh, those things, but it's whosoever desires. And, and on this journey, as you know, the spiritual journey, uh, there's great scenes, great sceneries. There are high mountains to experience. There's because there's high mountains, there's also valleys that nobody likes. But if we want the mountains, we've got to encounter the valleys. How many enjoy valleys <laughs> of spiritual valleys where you go through the drudgery? You cannot have the mountains unless you have the valleys. Amen. There'd be no, no mountains to experience, no refreshing to experience unless there's first valleys and mountains. The mountains reveal clear, refreshing atmospheres, great views, awesome experiences. But it's in the valleys where we gain our sustenance and our growth and our strength and our power. And all through life, whether we're talking about spiritual or natural, uh, to achieve the desired destination, there are always going to be hills to ascend and hills to descend. There's always going to be valleys to climb into and valleys to climb out. That's what makes life enjoyable. I don't like the valleys, but you know what? It makes life enjoyable. It really does. On the same note, the spiritual side, it's the same thing. And, and, and as I said earlier, the Lord has some side journeys for us. And, and uh, they're available to pick up nuggets of information uh, and empowerment for our walk with Him. And, and we've been looking at prayer. Everybody say prayer. And there's no place better to learn a prayer than out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. I can talk to a man and he can tell me how he prays. I can talk to a, 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 a scholar and ask him how he prays. But when I talk to Jesus and I hear the words of Jesus, he's telling me what he wants because he's the one receiving the prayer. One of his disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And so we find while he's on the ser doing the Sermon on the Mount and up on the mountain, he began teaching a few selected people. And as we looked at, it's not just a random choice or random thing that we do. It, it's a part of a sequence, amen, and, and to follow into deeper revelation, uh, deeper uh, relationship with him, and this is what brings us to where we're at. He began by teaching on preparation and uh, us choosing to pray. Everybody say choosing. Because we have to choose to pray. Don't care how much you've prayed before. You've got to choose to pray today. He began teaching on, on preparation, realizing who we're talking to. That's so important. Separating ourselves. Amen. As we sang at the very beginning about entering his chamber, separating ourselves from the affairs of the life. Removing our kingdom and our will and allowing his kingdom and his will into our lives. After preparation, he taught on replacing our emptiness because we just got rid of everything. And filling it with spiritual sustenance that he knows and he feels that we need. And again, it's not an automatic thing. Nothing with God is automatic. You don't deserve to be here. Boy, that's going to go over well online, isn't it? You don't deserve to be here. You have not lived a good enough life to deserve serving him. He has called you, he has chosen you, but you have responded, and that's why you are here. Praise God. So it's not automatic. Finally, as we looked last week, the next step was to seek forgiveness, amen, of our debts or moral failures, better known as sin. And remember, as we saw, our forgiveness is based on how much we're willing to forgive others. And if we're not willing to take this first step, we're closing the door on receiving forgiveness. And I know people who have never forgiven, yet I watch them dance in the Holy Ghost. Are they faking it? No, they're not. I've watched people uh, not forgiving and, and, and speaking in tongues and doing other things and preaching even. 
but not forgiving. And like I said last week, just because we do those things is not the reason or that, that's not the, the result of God blessing. It's a result of us touching God. It doesn't mean everything's right that we've received forgiveness. If I hold bitterness hurts the past, it shows I have not forgiven. If I bear bitterness in my heart, I have not forgiven. If faults keep nursing in my mind and rehearsing in my mind and coming out of my mouth, I have not forgiven. And I know, I, I, I'm not trying to repeat last week, we've got to continue, but it's so important because the Lord will not forgive you unless you forgive others. Out of the mouth of Jesus came the next part of the prayer journey and our prayer experience. And he said, this is the next step. Now, remember, I've said many times, a lot of serving God is within our mind, our attitude. But it's resulting in our life. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The willingness of our attitude forms such a powerful base for our action and our reaction. And as we've gone through the process of cleansing and the seeking and the opening and allowing and forgiving, the easy part and the very easy part would be just get up, open the closet door, and walk out. We've done our job. We've cleansed ourselves. We've acknowledged him. We've cleansed ourselves. We've got rid of our will and our kingdom and his will and his kingdom. We've forgiven our neighbor and our friend and our enemy. What's left? But Jesus said, whoa, hang on a minute. You're not done. The easy part would be to walk out, to step out of that closet. But Jesus said this. He said, before you leave, remember your walk. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. The Lord leads us. And he guides us, but he does not push us or prod us. This is important because if we do not have a spirit or an attitude willing to be a follower of the spirit, he is not going to force you to do anything. Does anybody understand or know a little bit about their own nature? Can I share your nature with you? If you're not following, you will try to lead. I'm going to say it again. If you're not following, you're going to try to take over. If you're not following, you're going to try to do it your way. Well, Pastor, how do you know that? Because I'm human. If I'm not willing to follow, then my nature is going to be to take over and try to lead. And Jesus was telling us here, he said, wait a minute, you've done all you've done. Now you've got to understand that you've got to be led of the Lord. So Lord, lead me. And, and that's revealing a nature in us that we need to have, that I'm willing to follow the leadership of something or somebody. In this case, we're willing to follow the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Ghost. See, if I don't make up my mind, if I don't have that attitude, if I don't have that spirit, the Holy Ghost can go everywhere around me. And if I'm not looking to follow, I'm not going to see it. See, I've got to search for him. I've got to long for him. I've got to go to him. I've got to see him. And I can't see him if my eyes are clouded by my own attitude. When, when you look at Israel as an example of the Old Testament, to, all through their wilderness experience, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day uh, led the nation. And the only time that leadership stopped was when the enemy was coming behind them and, and the fire or the cloud went behind them to protect them. But the fire and the cloud did not stay at the back and start pushing Israel. They still had to look 
to where the presence of God was going to see their next destination. It could have been two days from the time they arrived where they were. It could have been two months or two years. Amen. But they had to look to the leading of Almighty God to find out where they were going to go. If they chose not to follow the pillar, they would never have entered the promised land. It was a long journey. It was many, many years in the wilderness. They went in circles because of themselves, because they stopped following the spirit or, or the pillar. Amen. But nevertheless, as they followed and as it led them to the wilderness and as it took them in circles and as they learned to trust God, amen, it led them right to the promised land and into the promised land. Hey, but here we are on our journey, and sometimes this journey gets hard, it gets long, it gets redundant. Why am I going through this again? Why can't we just go home? Why can't we just be taken away? Lord, where are you today? Because the Lord wants something from us to learn to follow after him, whether we understand it or don't understand it. We are to follow after his spirit. The onus is not on Israel, and the onus, is, sorry, the onus is not on the Spirit. It's not on God. It's not on Michael or Gabriel to send you a message or help you. The onus is on you and I to learn to follow after Him. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11, The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy your soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fall not. And they shall be of thee shall be and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn thy, way, thy foot from the Sabbath, and from doing thy pleasure on the holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him and not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Once again, you notice here, the Lord is telling us all this, but then he puts something, amen, a two-letter word called if. See, it's not a given. If you'll do this, I will do that. If you do that, I will do this. So where's the onus? Is the onus on, oh, God is love, and he'll always bless, and he'll always forgive, and he'll always take care? No, he won't. Oh, pastor, you're, you're dangerous ground, I know. I'm going to say this, if. I do what he tells me, then he'll do those things. But if I don't do what he tells me, breaking this portion of scripture down, summarizing, we can say this, the Lord will always be there to guide, to satisfy, to bless, to supply, and to help, but has pivoted on, that, on the response of us if I follow him. If not, everybody say not. The promises are null and void. Why is it people can't get that from God, that God's got to be this magic genie 24 hours a day, seven days a week to bless them and help them when they don't care enough to bless God? That's where our society's gone. That's where our world is. And people believe that. Psalm 95, verse 1. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God. Oh, yes, he is. And a great king. Amen. Above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. And the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. 
and his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship, bow down, kneel before our the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people's pasture and the sheep of his hand today if we will hear his voice. You see, we want to read all the chapter 95 and, and verse 1 to 6 and part of 7, and, and we rejoice. We, oh, come, let us sing. Oh, come, let us rejoice. The Lord is good. And that, that should cause a dance in our step. But at the end of it, the very end of the scripture, amen, he put this statement. And he put one line amen, that, that justified everything and confirmed everything. And he qualified. He said, today, if you will hear his voice. Here it is again, that two-letter word, if. So, so we're saying, is the writer saying all that to, to say we're rejoicing? No, he wasn't. He was setting everything up. You know, we can come and we can rejoice and we can sing and we can shout. Amen. But today, if we will hear his voice, he is going to be our God. Yes. The word here, when you hear the word here, say that 10 times. The word here is not simply a word that means to tune in with your ears. It carries with it the connotation, then the implication of, uh, of, of attention, and not just attention, but obedience. So when he's saying today, if you will hear his voice, what he's saying here today if you will hear the voice of God enough to pay attention to it and obey it. See, when the voice of God speaks to us, whether it's through preaching, reading the word, studying, or audible, or some thought that God gives us from God, And we hear it audibly or visually. That's a wonderful thing. We're blessed. But if we pay attention to it, because we need to, that's a step up. And God doesn't give us this stuff so we can just put it in our memory and say, wasn't that a good thought? How many get thoughts from God? Please put your hand up. <laughs> we're in trouble if you don't. And they're good things, aren't they? Woo, we're blessed. I have, God has given me some thoughts once in a while. And they're mind blowing to me. And I'll go to somebody and share, and they're going, oh, yeah. Either they know all about it or did nothing for them because it wasn't for them. But when I hear the voice of God, amen, and, and so it, because I know it's from God, I need to pay attention to it. And I need to listen to it. And if I'm listening to something and pay attention to something, I'd better obey it. Because all those things that, that the writer wrote about come let us sing and rejoice and, and, and everything about him and our relationship is hinged. Again, this word hinged from last week is hinged on whether I'm willing to listen and obey. If I am not, you see, we thought the part, uh, amen, in prayer when, when we enter the chamber or come into the closet, that's so hard sometimes. And we thought it was difficult. To, and then we come in and, and we got to give up our will. And that's hard. And we got to give up our kingdom. That's difficult. To, and we thought that was hard. And then we've got to forgive. Oh, my soul. You think that was hard? We have got to get rid of every tradition that we have learned over the years of how God wants to bless us because we're here. 
Because he's telling us here, your relationship. Oh. Blessing and sister blessing. You guys are in love. Sister? Sister, are you in love? Oh, boy. Where am I going with this? Anybody else want to volunteer? I'm, a, I'm afraid of this one. But Brother Blessing was over in Canada, and she's over in Africa, expecting to come to Canada and expecting their, their love to be there. And all of a sudden, they find out when they, she gets here that the love is gone. What a tragedy. And it's not. I, I, I know you're just being sorry. <laughs> Leave me alone, husband. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> but you, you, know, you understand the tragedy of it all. Well, what a tragedy if we think that God is so in love with us that we don't have to listen to him or obey him and find out. And find out because of me, because I didn't want to, I heard him. I listened to him, but I didn't obey him. What a tragic event. Jesus said, not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord. Some are going to come to me. Have we not cast out devils in your name? Yep. Have we not done this in your name? Yep. Have we not done that in your name? Yep. In spite of what you did, I'm going to tell you, I don't even know who you are. Do you know what that sounds like? That sounds like a broken relationship. No, I'm sorry, not even a broken one. A destroyed, annihilated relationship. So how important is it? We thought it was so hard to give up our kingdom compared to this, where I've got my prayer is, Lord, forget the temptation. That's part of it. Lead me not into temptation, but simply lead me. Lead me. In Psalm 19, David wrote of the glory and the majesty of God. Heaven declares it. The firmament reveals it. His laws perfect it. His testimony is absolute sure. His statutes are right. His commandments are pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. His judgments are true and righteous. But his conclusion over this is this. More to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. See, we look at that, right? But he didn't stop there. He continued. In verse 11, he says this, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Whoa, majesty, glory, power. Awesomeness, intrigueness, perfection. And then he says, moreover, by these things am I warned, and keeping these, there's great reward. Again, there's that pivot. If I don't keep them, there's no reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I have been, I've been warned my obedience results in great results. Cleanse me. Keep me back from presumptuous sins or pride and arrogance. That's what presumption means. 
Keep me back from pride and arrogance. You know what pride and arrogance are? Simply put, pride is I'm doing it my way. That's what arrogance is. I'm going to do it my way. I can do it on my own. Pride says I'm doing it better. Pride says you know, I don't have to listen to you. Pride says I don't need God. And so David's writing here. He says all this great stuff about God. But Lord, keep me from my pride. See, I, we, we sing that song or it's sung. I'm a one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy rowing, huh? heaven-bound believer in the liberating power of Jesus' name. We're Christians. We're apostolics. We, we, we are the church. We are the body. We, we are the elite. We're the called out. We have a promise. We've got a hope. We're going to go home to see Jesus. He's going to change us in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That'll preach. But wait a minute, Lord. I, I have all that. But God, don't let it go to my head. Mm, humble me, God. I want to hear the word. I want to hear the word. I want to hear the word. I don't just want to hear it with my ears. I don't want to have tickling ears. I need to know, God, that my heart is right with you. Everything about me, and it can't be right unless you lead me. Because I know where my life led me. Some of you left the truth, and I'm not picking on you. Hey Amen. But you chose to go your way, and where did it lead you? Thank God, a big circle back to the house. But not everybody come back. James says this, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness, receive the, with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Did anybody look in the mirror this morning? Do you remember what you look like? Do you remember what you... Do, do, do you when you walked away, you think you look like something. <laughs> I'm serious. Think about this next time you look in the mirror. Make a face. And what do you look like? Because as soon as you walk away from that mirror, you forget what you actually look like. Powerful, isn't it? And this is what James is writing to the church. He said, you know, if, you, if you're just a doer, if you're just a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like that man looks in the glass and you forget. You know what reminds me to keep on living for God? Is when I get up in the morning, I live for God. Because the day that I get up and I don't live for God, it's so hard to get back on track. Anybody ever find that? Or is it just me being honest? When, when, uh, when, when I don't pray, and I've said this many times, skip a few days of praying, I go to prayer, and it's like, mumble. Because your body, your flesh, your humanity, your carnality wants to take over. I can remember, and I've said this many times, I can be on the, on the road and driving, turn the radio on, and I hear two tinkles of, of a song, and I know what the song is, but I can't remember a chorus. And I wasn't into music years ago when I was like young. I listened to it, all, the, all, the, you know, all that stuff that I listened to, but I wasn't into it. But I'm into church, and I sing choruses all the time. You, we were singing that one, uh, I can't even walk. 
And I'm looking at it, did we ever sing that song before? We sing the chorus all the time. I don't ever remember seeing those words of the verses. Why? Out of sight, out of mind. Because my carnality doesn't want to remember. Because when I sing that song, I can't even walk. I'm telling my flesh, you are a failure. You can't even walk. You think you're walking, but you can't walk without holding your hand. You're telling the other side of your life that it's no good. I'm sorry, your other side doesn't like that. That's why it's warring all the time with the Spirit. If you're not a doer, you're living a lie, and you're only fooling yourself. John records the words of Jesus as he warned of trying to enter the sheepfold in any different manner. John chapter 10, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, again leading, and the sheep follow him. Do you know why they follow? Because they know his voice. That word no is just not head no. It's, it's an intimate relationship with his voice. See, sometimes, if you haven't noticed, sometimes the Lord whispers to you, doesn't he? Sometimes he talks loud. Sometimes he yells. Sometimes he comes to the voice of Otis on the piano. Sometimes a pastor is teaching, and God is using his voice through him. Or a Sunday school teacher downstairs. So we've got to be, can I say it, intimate with that voice? Because the voice is not going to push us. Sometimes, everybody say sometimes. There are times in my life, and maybe yours too, I wish the Lord would prod me. Why? Because I'm lazy. Spiritually. <laughs> Every last one I say something. <laughs> but we're all that way. Every once in a while we need a prod. But the Lord says, I'm not here to prod you. I'm here to lead you. So we've got to know the voice of the shepherd. We've got to be willing to follow it. So to do that, we've got to understand it. Because there's no other way other than following him. John chapter 12, 23, Jesus said, The hours come and the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. He that hates his life in this world, shall keep it unto life eternal. He said, if any man serve me, here's that word again. I, I, I need to do a study how many times the word if is in the Bible. If any man serve me, let him go ahead of me. No. Let him follow me. Again, we're living in a society that doesn't want to follow, but they'll go to church. And here we are in the awesome, inspired, anointed presence of God. And he's telling us, if you want to serve me, you have to follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So my question this morning is, Brother Otis comes back to the piano. How or what is the best way to reveal to Jesus and to the world that you actually love Jesus? It's not found in praise. We need to praise him. It's not found in worship, but we need to worship him. It's not found in the shout or the dance. 
It's found in simply following him, hearing his voice and following. I may call myself all these things. Amen. I can call myself a Christian, an apostolic, a Pentecostal, whatever it is. But if I'm not following, I'm simply not following. Let's stand this morning. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man, they're ordered. They're ordered by the Lord, and he delights in the way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I've been young, and now I'm old, and we can all attest to that, most of us. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth and a seed is blessed. Can we make up our minds to be followers of Jesus? In our prayer, in our private prayer, the attitude of the Spirit is, Lord, lead me. See, the temptation, if I stop there, that's enough. Because if I'm, not, if I'm not following him, I'm going to fall into temptation. I'm going to go into evil because that's my nature. So let's find a place to pray this morning and ask the Lord to allow us or to help us to be followers of him in Jesus' name.